the painting of the altarpiece uh, presents us with a remarkable object of contemplation, uh, one whose dynamic architectural forms encourage our eyes to dart from sacred image to sacred image, um, linking them to one another and to episodes from the life of Christ and the Virgin, uh, so the Pieta and the Annunciation and so on. At the same time, the altarpiece depicted by our unknown painter with its twisting columns, broken pediments, um, glittering multifaceted surface, and incorporation of works of art in multiple media are textbook examples of the dynamism and theatricality that characterize Baroque art more generally. But is it, we might ask, a representation of an actual altarpiece? As a specialist in Spanish colonial art, I'm delighted to see the exhibition um, Highest Heaven in this beautiful installation um, here and to have a chance to look closely at these works of art today, which in many cases have not been um, widely exhibited. Um, so to have a chance to look at them very closely as we're able to is a rare opportunity. I'd like to begin by looking at um, what I think is the most spectacular painting in the show, the large one described in the exhibition catalog as Dominican altar of Our Lady of the Rosary with Christ child. And we're looking at a photograph of that on the screen. The name of the painter remains unknown, uh, but it's been proposed that this was painted in Peru in the late 1600s or early 1700s. In the most basic terms, this is a painting of a massive sculpture, an altarpiece made out of wood that has been gilded and heavily ornamented and which houses a number of sacred images, among them the one that is the star of the show, the lavishly robed Virgin Mary, um, sort of at the, the center, um, with robes overflowing out of the space of the altarpiece itself. The type of object uh, represented here is often called by its name in Spanish, retablo, um, and it's a kind of an object that straddles the line between church furniture on the one hand and church architecture on the other. Uh, it's the backdrop for an altar table, and in fact, in the painting, um, we see um, an altar table um, sort of in the foreground, a kind of a table typically adorned with uh, well, textiles, which I think is how we're supposed to understand this um, in this image, and with candles and with flower arrangements um, presented sort of as offerings. The forms of um, the altarpiece um, that we see painted here calls to mind the forms of church portals with columns and capitals and cornices and pediments and volutes. Uh, the largest altarpiece in a church is usually the one at the main altar, but as um, many of you, I'm sure, know, similar structures appear in a smaller scale uh, in the chapels that line the side aisles in those churches or in other settings, uh, monasteries, convents, and private homes among them. An example of uh, the kind of altarpiece to which this painting refers, um, like the object that it's capturing um, is something like this. Um, of course, uh, one that is different in scale from the one that we see in the painting, um, but a, an altarpiece from the Jesuit church in Cusco, Peru, which as uh, Katrina pointed out is a place that I've been um, researching for a few years now. Um, so we're looking at the uh, altarpiece, it, it, it looks sort of yellow in this photograph, and in the, in the lower left-hand corner, a map um, to orient us to um, where is Cusco in Peru. This is a place that I'm sure many of you have visited or will visit. Cusco was the sacred center of the Inca Empire, and this was the largest pre-Columbian empire in the Americas um, uh, at this time, the Aztecs were their contemporaries, uh, but the Inca Empire was, uh, or occupied a larger geographic area. Um, all of this changed in the 1530s um, when Cusco and much of the Andes were taken by Francisco Pizarro um, in the name of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, and Cusco and other um, places in the Andes were remade as Spanish colonial towns. 
The altarpiece um, that we're looking at in the photograph and the church in which it stands were built about a century and a half later. So we're beyond the, um, the initial contact period of Spaniards and Incas, a um, uh, hundred years or more later, um, in the aftermath of an earthquake that was devastating to the city of Cusco, this church and its altarpiece get built. Um, so we're, think, we're looking at probably 1650 to 1700, uh, maybe that period. Like the altarpiece in the painting from the exhibition, um, the altarpiece in Cusco houses multiple images in the form of oil paintings on canvas, um, relief sculptures, and freestanding sculptures. And it also includes some of the forms, um, the architectural forms that are characteristic of uh, altarpieces and in fact church portals of this period. Um, so here in the closer shot, I hope you can pick out, um, well, the point that I'm, I'm making is that um, some of these images are paintings, um, some of them are freestanding sculptures, and some of them are relief sculptures. Uh, but in terms of the architectural forms, I would draw your attention to two of them. Um, the first one, the twisting column, the twisting column, also known as the Solomonic column. Um, those of you who have studied the history of architecture know this. This type of column is called Solomonic because of the traditional belief that it was this kind of column that supported the, uh, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. And these columns in the painting, um, you'll notice, are shown uh, as being adorned with grapes and vines. And they may call to mind, uh, to some of you, the massive twisting columns of the Baldacchino by Gian Lorenzo Bernini at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So uh, architectural form number two that I want to point out is what I would call um, the broken pediment or the broken cornice, a form that approximates something like parentheses. And it's a form where we might, what we would think that in some other era, um, the designer uh, maybe would have closed it, right? Or maybe there would have been a point there. Uh, and so the, this distinctive form that is characteristic of, um, of altarpieces and, um, and um, church, or the, the portals to churches in the 17th century and later, um, is this broken um, pediment. A similar form uh, can be seen on the wonderful gilded and painted 17th century mirror in the show, also probably from South America. But here the broken pediment, or the, this, it's sort of a broken pediment, but it's got these volutes at the top. Uh, and to me, it resonates with the form of the pediment just above the virgin and child uh, in the painting of the retablo. These architectural forms appear on altarpieces and mirrors, as it turns out, uh, made throughout colonial Peru in the late 1600s and early 1700s, but they also appear in other places, perhaps most notably in southern Spain in the same period. Um, so here we're looking at an altarpiece um, with uh, an altarpiece from the Church of the Holy Charity, Santa Caridad in Seville, Spain, also designed and constructed in the 17th century. So approximately um, contemporary with the altarpiece in Cusco and perhaps contemporary with the painting. The effect of these forms, uh, the, the twisting Solomonic column and the broken pediment is to evoke a sense of movement, um, movement um, that sort of emphasizes movement up and down, a, a vertical axis. Um, and if we look at the vertical axis that is emphasized by these forms in the Huber painting, um, it's an axis composed of a series of sacred images. Uh, so let's take a look at them. Um, from moving from top to bottom, God the Father, depicted as the creator. One hand on a sphere, um, I suppose representing the globe. Another extended in a gesture of blessing. Um, this is not an uncommon theme for the uppermost image on an altarpiece. I, I didn't bring in other examples of it, but there are other examples of it. And here I would emphasize that the artist, our, our unnamed artist of the Huber painting, is presenting us with what is, in effect, a painting of a painting. 
Um, it, this, I, not to make this all about Rome and the Vatican or anything, um, but the, the, I, I couldn't help but thinking about the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in, in this one as well. Uh, beneath the image of God, uh, God the Father as the creator, the crucified Christ, um, a frequent subject uh, in the religious art of this period in Spain and in the Americas and of course elsewhere. And here too, um, we're faced with um, what I think we're supposed to understand as a painting of a painting. Um, the, this, um, to me, um, has the look, or the way that our, our uh, painter of the picture of the retablo has, um, has done it, it looks to me more like it's a two-dimensional image than a three-dimensional one. The crucifixion uh, is the subject of other works in, in other media, in the exhibition. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed. Uh, and I think these, these ivories, um, th this one um, from Portuguese India from the 18th century, this is about 15 inches in height, um, was probably designed to have been attached to a cross made of wood or another material. Um, the curators of the show, or at least in the label, um, suggest that it could also be a type of image that would have been um, carried in processions. Um, the crucifixion is a subject of this small painting from Cusco. Um, the, the name of the place is in the uh, text uh, across the bottom of the picture, and it bears the date 1770, um, so perhaps as much as a century after the production of the painting of the altarpiece that we've been looking at. In addition to the figure of the crucified Christ, uh, this painting on the left um, includes other figures. Um, one of them is definitely his mother, Mary. Um, the, the others make me think a little bit. Um, John the Evangelist is a good candidate for the red, row, red and green clothing. He's often depicted that way, but then where's the third Mary? There should be the three Marys. Who's at the bottom of the cross? Mary Magdalene, but not really. Um, so I, I think there are some, some questions about this, but I would draw your attention to the patron. Um, so this person at the left, um, who is depicted in a, uh, a pose that suggests that he's praying, and he's identified in the bottom of the text um, uh, of this panel as a certain Simon de Maisondo, um, so he's identified by name, and the text indicates that this painting was made at the behest of this patron as an expression of his Christian piety and devotion. Um, so though different in many ways, maybe they're more different than they are similar, um, these two representations of the crucified Christ coincide um, in a couple of details, but one of them is the darkened sky a reference to the gospel passages claiming that at the time of the crucifixion, the sky suddenly became dark as night. And this story would later be embellished uh, with reference to astronomical phenomena, uh, perhaps an eclipse. And the paintings make reference, I think, to this as well. You can see it more clearly uh, on the right. So there, so it's like a, sort of a crescent shape uh, with, with sort of like a flare of yellow and orange. Um, and in the sky near the arms of uh, the crucified Christ on the left, there are sort of similar crescent shapes, but I would want to look at the painting in person a little bit more closely to see what's happening there. Um, the painting that most resembles the one on the right, the, the painting out there in the world that most resembles that, this one on the right, is a painting in the collection of the Prado Museum in, um, in Madrid by the Spanish painter Alonso Cano. And here at the Worcester Art Museum, you have a wonderful painting by Alonso Cano of Christ, uh, Christ carrying the cross. Beneath the crucifixion, the Holy Spirit is represented in a traditional way as a dove. Uh, and here I believe the artist's depiction of this dove is an attempt to present this as a relief carving. Um, so we've been looking at paintings of paintings. Here a painting of a relief carving um, on something like a gilded uh, wooden medallion. Um, there's something about the 
the heft of the dove's body, let's say, um, that seems designed to create the illusion of a convex, rounded surface. And so this makes me think um, that our painter is trying to convince us that we're looking at a, something that, um, a, a convex shape. Beneath the Dove of the Holy Spirit uh, is the um, altarpiece's dominant image, the Virgin Mary holding the Christ child. And I think it's likely that we are supposed to understand her as um, seated with the Christ child on her lap. Uh, and I'll, I'll be able to explain that in a couple of minutes. Both, uh, both the Virgin Mary and the Christ child are dressed in garments um, elaborately embroidered in gold. They both wear crowns. And the Virgin holds in her right hand uh, what looks like a scepter, uh, and she also holds a rosary. This is a painting of a sculpture, or perhaps two sculptures, um, but it's also a painting of cloth. Um, the, these two sculptures have been dressed in um, these voluminous garments. Many altarpieces in Spain and Latin America, and in fact, all over the world, um, feature dressed statues um, like the one that we see in the painting. Um, so we see here on the right an example from Peru in this photograph of a retablo in Cusco and the image of Our Lady of Bethlehem, um, a dressed statue uh, of the Virgin Mary being either removed from that niche or being placed into it. Uh, we see our key architectural forms here, too, the broken cornice and the Solomonic columns. So we could guess a date for them, 1650 to 1700. Um, we also see um, a, um, a, a sculpture of the Virgin Mary in one of these altarpieces. In this example from Seville, um, the Church of Santa Maria la Blanca, um, Saint Mary the White, I suppose, could, could be a possible translation of that. Uh, and um, thinking about some of the works in the show, I mean, there are some three-dimensional images of the Virgin Mary um, and um, some that are sizable, um, sizable enough to have been the kinds of sculptures that would have been positioned in altarpieces. Um, so this one attributed to Francisco Javier de Brito, who was active in Minas Gerais, Brazil, in the 18th century. This is a statue that could have been dressed um, in an expression of devotion to the Virgin, but I can't say for sure that it ever was. Also of the type of statue of the Virgin that may have been dressed at some point in its history, I, I bet this one was, um, uh, this medieval Spanish one from the permanent collection here at the Worcester Art Museum, uh, perhaps from as early as the 12th or 13th century. It's this type of statue of the seated Virgin Mary holding the Christ child in her lap uh, that became one of the most renowned of the miraculous Iberian virgins, the Virgin of Guadalupe, housed today in a Hieronymite monastery in Estremadura in southwestern Spain, just north of Seville, well, quite a bit north of Seville, near the border with Portugal. Uh, and we see an image of that dressed statue uh, on the right. This Virgin of Guadalupe, the one that we see on the right, by the way, is different from the one um, that comes to be venerated in Mexico as an image that miraculously appeared on the cloak of Juan Diego, who was recently canonized by the Catholic Church. Um, so the same, that Mexican, that one that's a Mexican colonial phenomenon um, is a different Virgin of Guadalupe from this Spanish one, but they have the same name. The Spanish Virgin of Guadalupe is a statue um, and devotion to this Spanish Virgin of Guadalupe, the statue, also burgeoned in Spanish America in the colonial period. Um, so if we take a look at this painting from the exhibition, uh, we see evidence of that. Um, this, is, um, this is a painting, so this claims to be a painting of the statue that we see on the right. <coughs> 
It's likely that neither the artist who made the painting, probably in the early 1600s, nor the person who commissioned and owned it um, would have ever seen the dressed statue in the monastery in Spain. Um, rather, the appearance of the statue was made known in the Americas through visual representations of it in the form of um, prints, um, engravings, and book illustrations. Um, so an example is this one from a Spanish publication of 1597. Um, so here the question is, how does our painter in um, Peru in around, around the year 1600 or, or so, um, who is hired by someone to create an image of the Spanish Virgin of Guadalupe, um, how does that painter in Peru um, come up with, with the composition and know what the standard iconography of this subject is? So one hypothesis is that the painters were familiar with prints like this one on the right. And I think the correspondences are, um, are, are striking. Um, the, the billowing curtains being pulled away in both cases, um, this kind of conical um, dress on the Virgin, her crown, um, and then at the bottom of the composition, the two um, angelic figures who, who flank, the statue, flank the statue on the sides. Among the other statues of the Virgin Mary in Europe to which people in Spanish America were devoted was Our Lady of Loreto. Um, Loreto, as uh, many of you know, is a town on the eastern coast of central Italy where there's a shrine to a sacred uh, image of the Virgin in a small structure claimed by people who are devoted to this Virgin to be the house in Nazareth where the Virgin was born and the house in which the angel Gabriel um, announced to her that she would be the mother of God. Um, so um, this, um, this house, which is now in Italy, um, people who are devoted to the, the cult of Our, Our Lady of Loreto um, believe that it was the Virgin's house in Nazareth. According to tradition, the house was carried by angels to Loreto after first making a stop in Yugoslavia. M many of you <laughs> must know this story. In Loreto, it was enclosed in a basilica in the 16th century. Uh, the painting of Our Lady of Loreto in the exhibition resembles the sacred <coughs> image in some ways, but in others it does not. It may have been painted in Latin America, but precisely where in Latin America remains an unresolved question. The curators have proposed Lima as one possibility, um, or somewhere in Bolivia uh, is the other um, possibility proposed for this. Uh, but as was the case with the imagery of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Spanish America, the painter of this image would not have needed to see the statue in Loreto to produce the painting, for it too is uh, closely related to a widely circulating print on the same theme, and here too, the correspondences are striking. Both images include the angels on either side of the statue. Um, they're holding candles. Uh, both feature the hanging lamps um, in the niche in which the dress statue is placed. Um, in the Huber painting, the altar table on which the statue is placed um, is adorned with these um, three symbols which link the painting to the Franciscan order. Um, so this provides clues for researchers who may want to investigate the circumstances surrounding the production of this image and questions about its place of origin. I've been working on um, um, doing some research on a painting, the one on the right, on the same subject. Um, and this one, I think, is from Bolivia. Um, stylistically, that's what it looks like. It has many of, uh, shares many of the features with the print at the center. Uh, and also with the Huber's painting on the left. Um, in both of the paintings, there's a bit more architectural detail than uh, we see in the print. And in the painting on the right, um, the donors or patrons kneeling at either side of the statue, uh, I think it's likely that what this is, is uh, it, it's a commemoration of their donation of that dress and those jewels to the statue uh, of Our Lady of Loreto. Where the statue was, was it in Bolivia or somewhere else? Uh, that I don't have the answer to yet. 
I should point out that it was not only dressed statues from Europe that were the subjects of these paintings produced in the Americas. Um, uh, indeed, dressed statues revered in Spanish America, um, in, in Spanish America, which did not have European counterparts, were also the subject of paintings produced in Cusco and elsewhere in Peru. Uh, so at the top, uh, the two dressed statue <coughs> paintings that we just looked at, and in the, on the bottom, the um, two that we haven't looked at carefully yet. Um, so the, on the left, uh, from the exhibition, a painting of Our Lady of Wapulo, it's G-U-A-P-U-L-O, um, and the statue to which this re painting refers um, was said to have been made by Spanish sculptors and brought to the first church at a place called Wapulo near Quito, um, today Ecuador. And on the basis of the painting's style, it probably was made in Cusco. Uh, here the statue is presented against a dark background and uh, with these uh, red curtains uh, at her side, which we've seen in some of the other images. Oops. Another, um, the, uh, to the right of Our Lady of Wapulo is Our Lady of the Rosary of Pomata, um, a statue revered in southern Peru in a small town on the shores of Lake Titicaca, and whose distinctive painted images typically feature crowns with um, headdresses of feathers, uh, which you can see in this image. The dressed statue um, in the painting of the altarpiece that we've been looking at, however, differs from these other paintings of dressed statues in that it positions the robed virgin and child in the larger context of an altarpiece. And it encourages viewers to contemplate the relationship of the dressed statue um, to other paintings and to other sculptures housed in these gilded niches and frames. So perhaps most obviously, the Virgin appears beneath images that together constitute the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The image of the Virgin holding her son beneath the crucifix might also be seen to um, prefigure uh, relate to in some way the scene known as the Pieta or Lamentation of the Virgin, uh, an example of which is included in the exhibition. Um, this is a painting, um, this is an example of a painting um, um, where the name of the painter is known, Melchor Perez Olguin, uh, an artist based in Potosi, Bolivia. Uh, Potosi was the location of rich silver mines. Um, there are many uh, silver objects in the exhibition and some of that silver must have come from Potosi. Um, it was one of the largest and wealthiest cities in the world in the 17th century. It was also an important center of artistic production in the period of Spanish colonial rule and this is one of two paintings by uh, this artist in the exhibition, the other being a small um, but very elaborately framed image of the Christ child with Saint Joseph. Other interrelationships among the images are evident when we consider um, the figures that flank the dressed virgin and child. Um, so here, um, pointing out the details of um, these two angels. And uh, here I believe the painter is indicating that they, like the dressed image of the Virgin, are to be understood as statues. Um, in both cases, the, um, the feet of the figures project ever so slightly from the pedestals um, on which we are to understand them as, as being perched. A similar kind of image from the exhibition is one identified as Saint Michael the Archangel, which is over 40 inches in height and said to be from 18th century Minas Gerais, Brazil. Um, so similarities between the painted um, statue of an angel and the actual st statue of the angel on the right are clear. Um, both have a red cloak, both have a helmet adorned with feathers. Um, and the image, the painted image, the one on the left, um, like the sculpted one on the right, also is a representation of Saint Michael, uh, the archangel, identified as such by the text on that 
um, banner or, that he holds in his hand, which reads, Quien como Dios, or who is like God, a phrase associated with the archangel. The angel on the other side of the dress statue is identified by the text on um, the banner he holds, which reads, Ave gracia plena, hail full of grace, a reference to the words uttered, um, he uttered at the Annunciation when he delivered the news to Mary that she would be the mother of God. In fact, um, here I think the positioning of uh, the angel Gabriel to the side of the Virgin Mary calls to mind the traditional iconography of the Annunciation, uh, an iconography represented in the exhibition um, um, by um, this painting on the left, um, probably produced in Cusco, um, like many others uh, in the show. In it, uh, we see Gabriel on the right, Virgin Mary kneeling on the left, and these clouds um, that dominate the upper part of this composition suffuse the domestic setting with its rug uh, and the pillow and the bed with a supernatural sense. The image of Gabriel on the altarpiece also suggests an original context for the painting of um, this painting on the right of the angel Gabriel, which is in the exhibition. His gesture, um, the, po the position of his body, that dark background with a horizon line at the bottom, all suggest that a painting like this one may originally have been part of an altarpiece alongside an image of the Virgin. Um, and I was thinking, um, specifically about the case of this uh, altarpiece from the Jesuit church in Cusco, uh, where this kind of a painting of an angel, um, similar to the one in the show, appears as part of the composition next to a sculpture. The painting of the altarpiece um, presents us with a remarkable object of contemplation, uh, one whose dynamic architectural forms encourage our eyes to dart from sacred image to sacred image, uh, linking them to one another and to episodes from the life of Christ and the Virgin, uh, so the Pieta and the Annunciation and so on. At the same time, the altarpiece depicted by our unknown painter with its twisting columns, broken pediments, um, glittering multifaceted surface, and incorporation of works of art in multiple media are textbook examples of the dynamism and theatricality that characterize Baroque art more generally. But is it, we might ask, a representation of an actual altarpiece in the way that the paintings of dressed statues in the exhibition are representations of actual statues? This to me is the key research question to ask about this painting. And I think an initial step um, in trying to answer it would be to identify the dressed statue depicted here. The proposal um, has been that it's a representation of Our Lady of the Rosary, and this is rooted in the observation um, that she does indeed hold a rosary uh, in her hand. So it's in her right hand, I think it's sort of red, um, and um, that a symbol of the Dominican order um, appears near the top of the altarpiece, and the Dominican order is traditionally associated with devotion to the rosary. So in, for all of these reasons, and there are other rosaries uh, in, uh, in the altarpiece as well, for those reasons, this identification um, makes some sense. But images of Our Lady of the Rosary, like this one on the right that we looked at, um, whether they be from the Americas or from Europe, um, have an iconography that is different from the one that we see in the Huber painting. Uh, more specifically, images of Our Lady of the Rosary, whether they be sculptures or paintings, typically depict the mother of Jesus Christ standing, not seated, holding her son to one side of her body, not in her lap, at the center of her, her body, um, and with exposed, uh, long, flowing hair. In contrast, the image that we've been looking at is that of a seated Virgin Mary holding her son on her lap, centered on her body. Um, so in, uh, in this way, I mean, so this was sort of the, the clue um, that uh, made me think about looking for other dress statues that look more like this one from the painting. Uh, it turns out that there are a number of these um, that are uh, objects of veneration 
in southern Spain, probably elsewhere too, but definitely in southern Spain. So consider, for example, Our Lady of the Kings, Nuestra Señora de los Reyes, a dressed statue of the Virgin, um, as I said, venerated in a number of places, but no most notably in a chapel dedicated to her in the Cathedral of Seville. Um, so we see a photograph of that dressed statue in her altarpiece on the right. Our Lady of the Kings and her altarpiece in Seville were the subject of a number of um, late 17th century paintings. So we also have here a precedent or maybe even a, a contemporary example of um, the creation of a painting of not just a dressed statue of the Virgin, but the whole altarpiece. Um, this one is by the civilian artist Francisco Meneses Osorio and was painted in 1696, possibly around the same time as the, um, the Huber painting. Um, so my point is that images such as these, um, such as this one on the right and the other ones like it, show that paintings of entire altarpieces um, constituted something like a subcategory of paintings of dressed statues in this period. The comparison brings to light a number of points of coincidence. They include um, the disposition and dress of the virgin and child, but also um, the presence of a cornice um, bearing a similar text in both cases. Um, so here, uh, and then in the red band, all the way at the top of the image on the left, um, uh, on the right, I'm sorry, um, the, um, the text in the painting from the exhibition here in Worcester says, um, Concebida sin pecado original, conceived without original sin. Uh, and the text on the right says the same thing, but it, it is a bit more lengthy. Um, both images are also flanked with red curtains. There are perhaps more differences than there are similarities between these two, but could the Huber painting be referring to an altarpiece dedicated to Our Lady of the Kings, maybe not the one in Seville, um, but one set up somewhere else. Another candidate is Our Lady of Grace, a dressed statue of the Virgin venerated principally in Carmona, a small town near Seville, uh, but also in other places. And points of commonality between these two um, in the, include the position of the Christ child, but also the scepter. Um, the presence of a rosary as part of her dress. And um, I think uh, the image on the right makes reference to this idea of the, these kind of scalloped forms that look sort of like lace uh, in the image on the left. A way in which, which this imagery of Our Lady of Grace could have found its way to the Americas is through a print like this one, um, uh, de depicting Our Lady of Grace, which is um, quite similar to the depiction of the Virgin in the, um, from the Huber collection. Uh, a third candidate is Our Lady of the Dew, D-E-W, uh, a dressed statue of the Virgin venerated in Huelva, also near Seville uh, and elsewhere, um, whose image was disseminated through prints like this one. Um, so there are other candidates too, and without going through any more of them, I'd simply like to suggest that the identification of this dressed statue uh, in the painting in the exhibition remains an unanswered question for now, but it's an avenue for research on the painting. Um, the, the next research question I would pose is why would someone in Peru or elsewhere in Spanish America commission a painter to produce an image like this one? And one possibility uh, I, I don't think this is a viable one anymore. I was going to say that um, it was designed to take its place in a chapel where it stood in for an altarpiece. And there are examples of um, altarpieces that are painted, but they're designed to trick the eye into thinking that you're looking at an actual altarpiece, maybe especially in a dark space. But I think that the size of this one, it, it's too small for that. that, that argues against this. More likely, I think, is that this painting um, documented a patron's devotion to the dressed statue, whatever her identity may have been, um, and perhaps to a particular but yet unidentified altarpiece in an unidentified church. In this scenario, the function would be akin to that of other works of art that serve to document devotion and generosity of their patrons. Let's see. 
Devotion to dress statues could be expressed through the commissioning of a painting, but it also um, entailed financial support of the dress statue itself, as well as the altarpiece and chapel devoted to the statue. Um, so paintings like this one, and I think some of the other ones that we've been looking at are evidence of um, what I would call um, the economics of devotion in the early modern Spanish world. Um, that is, that de part of devotion entailed piety and a certain um, uh, interacting in a certain way with the sacred image, but there also was the expectation of the financial support of the image, buying a new dress and cape and crown for her, uh, paying for the upkeep of the altarpiece or the chapel um, in which she was, <coughs> which she was placed. Um, Right, so I haven't been able to link the Huber painting to, as I said, a particular dressed statue or altarpiece, but an examination of archival documents in Seville show that in the late 1600s, the King of Spain issued a series of royal decrees ordering the collection of funds from people in Peru for the completion of chapels in Spain dedicated to Our Lady of the Kings, Our Lady of Grace, and other advocations of the Virgin. The Americas, um, at this time with the rich silver mines of Potosi and other sources of wealth um, were attractive places to extract wealth for these and other purposes for use on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so my working hypothesis is that this painting was commissioned by someone in Peru um, who, was, who hired a painter to make this to document devotion to Our Lady of whatever this is and probably financial contribution to a dressed virgin statue in Seville maybe, in Peru maybe. Um, there are many options for where the statue would have been. Um, so in conclusion, I'd simply like to say that in my view, uh, this examination of some works in the exhibition underscores the vibrancy of the field of um, Spanish and Portuguese colonial art history. Um, it's a field whose objects of inquiry, um, as we've seen, are inherently compelling and inherently global, and which thus speak in some way to the world in which we live today. There remain uh, many as yet unanswered questions in this field of study, and exhibitions like Highest Heaven make it possible for those of us interested in this subject to take a close and careful look at a host of spectacular objects um, to contemplate the world in which they came to be and to learn about the people who made, commissioned, and saw them. Thank you. I noticed that some of those cherub heads appear in other places in the altarpiece. And if we look at actual altarpieces from this period, there are carved heads, um, carved heads of them. I mean, here, I don't know. I, I wonder if it's supposed to suggest the idea of clouds, like she's sort of floating on clouds, and to, to transform this space of the altarpiece into something a bit more supernatural. But I think it's also the case that if we looked at um, paintings um, or prints of the Virgin Mary in any one of these guises, um, that there often are these figures there. I mean, it's, it becomes a standard part of the iconography. Um, it is, it's tempting to think about the number five, but, but I don't have an answer for that. I don't have the measurements of it here, but I think it's no more than like two meters or six feet, maybe. Um, and so one thing that I've been thinking about is um, if I could identify a group of other paintings of altarpieces and think about size, uh, I think that would tell us something, because if it's a sort of like a sub-genre of painting that's designed to be displayed in a particular way, maybe they're all the same, the same size. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to track down some other examples of these, and I've found a few, um, none that looks exactly like this. I think the um, label text in the exhibition says um, that this refers to an altarpiece in a cathedral in Peru without identifying the church. And I think that's possible, but I think there are also many other possibilities for what the, 
the place where this altarpiece could be if it existed. Thank you so much. And yeah. please join us down the cafe. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks.